Who does God reveal himself to? Through whom does he work? To whom does he speak? Could it possibly be that he could even speak to you, through you, reveal himself to you or someone you know? Now, believe it or not, God doesn't always pick religious people. In fact, lots of times it was hardly, it was, it, it, he picked people who were simply not religious people, were not the religious leaders. So this is part two of a message about to whom and through whom God works, because we're in the very end times, and certainly 2,000 years closer to it than the Apostle Paul was. And so we're very, very close, and we know from prophecies God is going to reveal himself in dreams and visions and many, many ways to all kinds of people in the coming years. And if we're not ready for it, we're simply going to miss a lot of revelation, a lot. Hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields. I'm founder and host of Light on the Rock, lightontherock.org, where you are. And I just want to welcome you to this website where our whole goal is to magnify our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ and to form a deep, deep love uh, just that, that oozes out of you for them and from them and uh, to other people that, from you as well. It's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, relationship that he's opened up to us and let's take advantage of it and love him with all of our heart and mind and soul and each other as well. So that's the goal. Well, we're live, living in exciting times. You got that? Bible times. We're living in Bible times. I believe years from now, many years from now, for millennia from now, people will come up to you, uh, you know, in the, in the world to come and say, tell us again what it was like back in 2020, uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years, well, however many years it is before certain things and events happened. What was it like back then? Tell us how God told you what the plan was to bring things to a close at the end of the age. Tell us what that was like. We're in Bible times and we're in times when we look back and we read the stories of how God revealed himself to Abraham and, or, or to various ones, to King David. And we, we envy that sometimes, or how uh, an angel appeared to Peter in, in prison. We're going to live through those things. You know why I know that? Because the Bible says God doesn't change. The Bible says, I change not, Malachi 3, 6. The Bible says there's no shadow of turning in our Father. He doesn't change. We're, we're told Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever in Hebrews. So here's my point. The way he got operated in the past will be the way he's going to operate again in the years ahead because he doesn't change. So let's first praise our Father and thank him that even though we're having the COVID-19 going on as I speak, even though churches are being shut down, church buildings, church organizations, church, church congregations, corporate groups are being shut down, you and I are not going to be shut down because you and I have the Holy Spirit inside of us and we are the church. We don't go to church. We are the church. They can't take that Holy Spirit from me. They can't lock me down. They can't lock the Holy Spirit down in me or in you. So let's praise God that we have that knowledge. And God never loses. And whatever's happening in our elections, whatever's happening in our country, uh, sometimes we'll get depressed, sometimes we'll get down. God won't lose. I've read the end of the book, his book. And in the end of his book, we win. God wins. Got that? <laughs> they can try all they want. You're not going to get God's true people down. You're just not. So wait for him and let's praise and sing and put some hymns of praise and worship constantly or often around you at least and see what God is going to do. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we come before you. Yeshua, how HaMashiach, the Messiah, we come before you. May the Lion of Judah roar in these end days. May the Lord of the host, the Master of the heavenly armies, come charging into the fight for the right cause, for your plan to work out. Father in heaven, we don't know what your final plan is, though some claim to be prophets to know. I don't know. I thought it looked good that President Trump would be reelected, the side that tries to protect the unborn babies. Like Leviticus 20, you told us to watch out, that we don't hide our eyes. So, Father in heaven, I just pray that right now we have faith in you. We look to you. We love you. We know you're in charge. We know that you've got everything under control. 
and sometimes we want you to act right now, but your timing is always best, and we rely on that, we submit to it, we worship you, we praise you for your timing. And it absolutely, Father in heaven, uh, give us the peace to know that you're there. Yeshua, our Savior, we want you back here really fast. <laughs> we really do. May your kingdom come and be here on the earth, your millennial reign. May it start. We thank you. We praise you. We look forward to having you here. We lift our eyes and we lift our hands up to you in worship and praise. And we just ask you now to put your Holy Spirit in this sermon on those who are listening to it, on myself speaking it, that there'll be your words, your thoughts, and your words, Father, and your, your spirit just flow down now upon us all, and we thank you for it. In Yeshua, our Master's name, amen. All right. So we're in the Bible times. I'm discussing this topic because I am seeing more and more people who call themselves prophets, and some of them may well be true prophets, for all I know. Well, time will tell. But we're in exciting Bible times. God is letting his plans be known. God is revealing himself through somebody in these last days. And you won't have to look real hard to find prophets telling you who's going to win the election, what's going to happen in America, or around the world. And, but we have to be careful. We have, there are certain rules God's given us about prophets and to whom and through whom he works. I'll review that lightly in the sermon, but really you should hear part one before hearing this particular sermon. So um, I still think, though, Trump, President Trump hasn't won the election. Uh, this is uh, November 11, as I record this. Uh, it is being contested by him. We'll see what God does with that. God can do whatever God wants to do, and God's miracle can reverse this whole thing. We still have time. But if it doesn't happen, we must not get down. I thought Trump would win. I didn't prophesy he would because I never had someone appeared to me as an angel or whispered in my ear. I did have very strong feelings that he would win the election. He still might. But there are people who claim to be prophets out there who are claiming very, very specific dates and specific things. And uh, as you heard from last time, uh, if, we, if certain things don't come to pass, then it wasn't a revelation from God. It's simply that, uh, that simple. So a lot of people out there are calling themselves prophets and apostles and so on. Of course, God in the past did speak to us through his prophets, and now he speaks through us through his word and through his Messiah, Yeshua, his son. It says in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, at least the first part of verse 2, I'll read it, Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at uh, various times and in sundry ways spoke in times past to the fathers, that means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the forefathers we had in the pro by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So God the Father used prophets to get his word out, and now he's working through us through his Son. But as I started the show last time, God does not limit himself to using prophets. And in fact, it says in, the many, in these last days, uh, many, many, I'll pop some scriptures up here, Matthew 24, verse 11 and verse 24, Yeshua says that there will be many false prophets, false messiahs, Peter and John were warning about false teachers and false prophets. Uh, Paul even said in one of his uh, talks to the Ephesian elders who were gathered before him that I know that when I leave, there will come ravenous wolves from among you. And so anyway, 2 Peter 2 verse 1, 1 John 4 verse 1 are scriptures that talk about false prophets and false teachers in the end time. It's going to get so bad Matthew 24, 24, I'll read it. Matthew 24, 24 will culminate in a great false prophet and an antichrist who is so persuasive that he might even deceive the very elect. And uh, God's very own chosen people could be hoodwinked by a coming prophet. How would you be hoodwinked? The person would have to be so sweet and yet so powerful and calling down fire from heaven and doing wonderful miracles, maybe healing people. I don't know what they'll be, but we're told that a lot of the things that he'll be doing are by demonic power, not just by trick of hand, sleight of hand or something. Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets 
will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. So don't think that in this two-part sermon I'm at all saying that when you hear a prophet or someone who claims to be a prophet saying something that you should, oh wow, you should just start listening. No, there are rules, the ground rules God gave us. I covered those last time. Let's cover some of them quickly today. For full detail, go back to part one. Many will claim that God appeared to them, spoke to them, that the Lord spoke to them, that Jesus spoke to them. They'll use different names, Yeshua, Jesus, whatever. Or an angel came up, or they had a vision or a dream. In Jeremiah 14, 14, God says, all these people are coming up saying, I've sent them, they, ha they got the word from me, and I never sent them. Jeremiah 14, 14, Jeremiah 23, 21. Some he sent, some he talked to, obviously. So we have to be sure that we're not just listening to a lot of false prophets and prophecies in these last days. He also tells us in Isaiah 8.20, if they teach against God's word, according to the law and the testimony, if they don't preach according to this, it's because they have no light in them. It says something like that in Isaiah 8.20. We'll put it up there. Isaiah 8.20. Now, if someone gives a specific date, a specific sequence of events, specific details, and they say it was because God gave them that revelation, and those things do not come to pass, it's not from God. Our Father doesn't get mixed up. The Holy Spirit that comes into us doesn't get mixed up. It's okay to have opinions. If the, if the speaker, if I or anybody else says, now, no angels appeared to me. I don't have a revelation from God on this, but it seems to me that blah, 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 or my opinion is blah, blah, blah. That's okay. That's perfectly okay. As long as it's very clear, I have an opinion on this. Let's see how it works out. It doesn't make him a false prophet if it doesn't work out. But if someone says, God spoke to me, I had this dream, I had this vision, and here's the sequence of events of what's coming up, and it doesn't happen like that, I'm sorry, you either have a false prophet or false revelation. It wasn't from God. It's that simple. God doesn't change. He doesn't change at all. There's no shadow of turning in him. It says in James 1.17, uh, Yeshua, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So last time I showed how God, who changes not, and so we'll keep doing the same things, revealed world events and prophecies to pagan leaders. Remember Pharaoh and the six fat cows that came out of the river, swallowed up by seven lean cows? I covered all that. I gave you the scriptures and everything last time. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He had this statue, a head of gold and chest of silver and so on. And, and, and that was a prophecy that goes all the way to the very last days when Yeshua comes back to set up his kingdom on earth. So then there's Belshazzar. I think the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says the son of, but I think he was actually a grandson. And grandsons are also children of, okay? We're children of Israel. We're great, 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 great grandchildren. So Belshazzar, whether son or, or grandson, Daniel 5, actually saw a hand. Imagine that, a hand writing <laughs> A hand writing on a wall, and you're watching this hand, it's just a hand, writing on a wall. And they were also drunk, and they had a drunken orgy going on. They were drinking out of the gold uh, utensils and, and paraphernalia of the, of the temple, and God was pretty upset. And that very night, Babylon fell. But Daniel came in and interpreted the, the dream. The many, many tekel Upharsin, his days were being numbered. So then uh, there, I covered last time how in Psalm, I mean in Isaiah 45, God even mentioned by name a world ruler of the second kingdom, the Persian Empire, Cyrus. And God even called him his own anointed. He's my anointed. He's going to do certain things. He's going to help rebuild the temple. He's going to tell, let the Jews go back. So there's a lot more information in part one. My point was God sometimes uses world leaders. 
Are you ready if he does that again? What if President Macron in France says, I had a vision, I had a dream. 99% of us would probably laugh. I'm telling you, it could happen. It could happen because God's worked that way in the past. I just rattled off a bunch of examples. There are more. There are more examples of world leaders that, that, that uh, God used. I ended last time by talking about how God works with children. Sometimes young ones, real young ones, like Samuel, might have been 12, might have been 13 or 14, might have been 8 or 9. The Bible doesn't give us his age. He was just a child. But Jeremiah says, I'm just a child. I'm just a youth. The word he used there for a child is, is newborn all the way to adolescent. But um, so somewhere between probably 7 to 12 years old, probably more like 12 or 13, I want to think anyway. I don't know. He's very young, very young. He had visions. He had God, and the word of God came to me and said, all that's talking about Jeremiah, <clears throat> King David. Uh, God spoke to him. I love that time, even when, uh, of course, he was a, a child, uh, when he was anointed, is my point. But God spoke to him, and, and one time he was asking God in prayer, what's my battle plan? And I love that one where God says, well, when you hear the sound of marching in the mulberry trees over there, that's when you are to move. Because he's, God is basically saying, because that's when my angels, the Lord of hosts and my angels are going to be marching. So he comes back to his uh, generals and his colonels and majors and others. It's equivalent of those. And, and they said, okay, chief, what's the, what's the battle plan? Well, when we hear marching up in the sky above those mulberry trees over there, that's, <laughs> I love that. I just love that, how God probably <laughs> laughed at the look on the faces of his generals. Anyway, are you and I ready to listen to a dream, a revelation, a vision God could give a child? I don't know if I'm ready. If my grandson, a 12-year-old, 9-year-old, 6-year-old, comes to me and says, Poppy, I have a dream. God told me I should tell you. that He wants you to tell everybody. That's what happened to Samuel. That's what happened to Jeremiah. God doesn't change. So let's move on. My, my point about the children, remember Joseph? He was a child. He was probably just 12 or 13 or 14 when he started having these dreams, maybe younger, about the other sheafs representing his siblings. They caught on real quick, bowed down to his sheaf, and uh, so on. Would you have believed Joseph if you had been his brother? Would you have accepted a teenager, a younger Jeremiah, as God's prophet? It's a thoughtful question, isn't it? So let's continue today now with the theme of God using the young people and old people. Be ready for God to be revealing himself in a lot of ways. Do you remember what Peter said in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost? All 120 men and women were gathered there together, and all 120 were empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak in other languages that they had never learned. And Peter got up. People thought they were drunk. Peter said, it's nine in the morning. Come on, guys. No one's been drinking. He referred people who came into Joel 2. I want to read there, I'll, but he quotes it right here in Acts 2. We'll put it up on the board. Acts 2, verses 15 to 21. Remember that he and the early apostles thought, of course, that Yeshua was going to set up his kingdom uh, his millennial reign as we know it today, but they thought he would set up the kingdom and become the king over Judah and over the whole world and restore the fortunes of, of uh, Judah uh, back to their prominence that they wanted it to be, that he would destroy the Roman armies and so forth. They thought all that was initially thought it was going to happen. Remember, just before Pentecost, they said to him, asked him, are you at this time going to set up, restore the kingdom to Judah? So here's Peter's uh, statement, Acts 21, 15 to 21. These are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. That's 9 a.m. But this was spoken of by Joel. He now quotes Joel 2, Joel 2, verses 28 to 32. 
It shall come to pass in the last days. He thought he was in the last days. That's why I said in the beginning, we're 2,000 years closer to the return of Yeshua than Peter was. So come now, what's 2,000 years? A thousand years is as a day, it says up to God, who's been around forever and ever, and is out outside of time and space. What's 2,000 years? You know, even when uh, Adam and Eve were told that in the day you eat of that fruit, the forbidden fruit, in the day you eat of it, dying you shall die, as the Hebrew has it, you shall surely die. They did. A thousand years is as a day. That very day, that very thousand years, a day as God counts it, they died. What was he, 930 years old or something? That's not in my notes, but it just came to me as I was talking here. So, I mean, when Paul and Peter and those pe people are saying that we're in the last days, that's really the way it looked to them. Verse 17, Acts 2, verse 17, comes to pass in the last days, says, God, that I will pour out my flesh on all, my spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants, my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit on those days and they, sh in those days, and they shall prophesy. And then, after that happens, because so this is going to be before the millennium. This is it says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and so on. Before the coming, be this is all before the coming, the, the great and awesome day of Jehovah, the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Revelation 6. Verses 12 to 17 speaks of the various seals. In Revelation 6, 12, it talks about the heavenly signs. I believe that's the sixth seal. So Peter is saying here, Joel is saying here, that the prophecies and the dreams and the visions are going to come before the coming of Christ, before the heavenly signs, probably before the Great Tribulation. So we're, I think, due to start seeing some of those I hope anyway, my opinion, okay, no one said that in 2021 we're going to start, no one said that to me. But just, I, I'm giving this sermon so that we're ready. We're ready to say, hallelujah, thank you for your revelation. When we follow the, uh, the ground rules, it, it has to come to pass, it has to be speaking according to God's word, and, uh, and so forth. The, the ones that I've mentioned as the ground rules. Are you ready for young men? Are you ready for old men? Having legitimate visions and dreams, telling you about it. So I have so much more to say to prepare you for me to be looking up at the right places at the right times of what's coming. I, I thought God still had plans for Trump, and he may still. We may still wake up and see Trump as our president. If not, who knows? Maybe God's timing is different than ours. Maybe God is thinking, I want to use President Trump in 2024 or someone else. But my point is, we just have to trust that God knows what he's doing, have faith in him, and keep asking that his will be done. But let's not scorn or spurn God's revelations when it comes from a child or unexpected sources or ordinary people. I'm just warming up, okay? Most of the prophets and apostles whom God chose to work with, who are, become, who are going to become the great leaders of the of the future, of forever. A lot of them were not close to God when God chose them. Some of them didn't know him at all. Moses didn't even know God's true name. When they ask me, what's your name? What am I going to say? He says that in Exodus 3. He says, when, okay, so I go back there and they say, okay, who was this who spoke to you? What's his name? I don't know your name. He kept asking what the being's name was in Exodus 3, verse 13. Moses was a felon on the run because he had killed somebody. He had killed an Egyptian. When the Almighty chose him, Moses, the felon, to be his prophet, one of the greatest prophets. Would you have thought that? If you had known Moses' background, this guy should be in jail, and God's using him? Are you kidding me? Can't be him. That's the way a lot of us would have thought. Isaiah, what a great book God inspired for him to write 
wonderful, beautiful words and language. Isaiah said he had a filthy mouth. You never know that from the gracious words that he penned. Isaiah 6, 5, I said, you know, at the beginning of Isaiah 6, Uzziah had died, and he sees now Jehovah in his majesty on a throne, in a vision, and um, woe is me, I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. They like to give the finger and use the F word and stuff like that, and so do I, is what Isaiah is, seems to be saying here. And God cleansed his lips. An angel came, a seraph came and grabbed a coal from the altar and, uh, and stuck it on his tongue and somehow that cleansed his tongue. For my eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. And he ends up writing a beautiful, beautiful book. Prophecy. The minor prophet, quote unquote minor prophet. Air quotes, they call him, I guess, huh? Amos. He was simply a shepherd from Tekoa, five miles south of Bethlehem, and a picker of sycamore uh, fruit when he wanted to add to his income. That was it. He was unschooled as a prophet. He even says so. God didn't choose the high priests or the Levites. He went to a shepherd from Tekoa and a picker of sycamore fruit, if that's the same one. Maybe I'm getting that mixed up with someone else. But anyway, um, would you have listened to a shepherd? Amos? Ezekiel was the son of a priest, but not all the prophets were sons of priests or had that background. We know precious little, in fact, about the backgrounds of Joel. Joel, okay, means uh, Jehovah is God. Eliyah, Elijah, my God is Jehovah, is what his name means. Uh, Micah, Nahum, Malachi. We know very little about them, frankly, but God used them, unknowns, nobodies. That could very well happen again. Would you listen to someone who you never heard of before, who was a nobody? How about the 12 apostles? Who were they? Probably four or five of them were fishermen. We know James and John were the brothers of sons of Zebedee. We know Peter and Andrew who were brothers were. They probably knew each other, those four. And uh, it could well be that others in there could have also been fishermen, Philip, Thomas, Nathaniel, who were all from the same general area. And we're quite willing to get in the boat to go fishing. One, Matthew was about as bad as you can get, a despised tax collector who cheated people. They all cheated people, is what everybody else thought. I don't think God picked Matthew because he didn't cheat anybody. God, God after all, did have lunch with Zacchaeus. And he admitted, Zacchaeus admitted, he had cheated people. He was a tax collector. So these men that, whom God chose... To, have, to be the ones to have their names written on the foundation, on the foundation walls or foundation points of the wall that's around Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, were considered uneducated men, fishermen. I imagine they knew how to read, but I can't guarantee you that. But, but anyway, they probably did. And the religious leaders of their day, they certainly knew how to read by the time they were apostles. Look at Acts 4, verse 13, if you think I'm saying it going too far on that. Acts 4, verse 13. Uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jews, uh, the priests, had all been warning these 12 apostles, you guys have to stop preaching in Jesus' name. He's dead. He's, it's, it's, a it's a foregone conclusion. Stop doing it. And they spoke and explained why and everything. And Acts 4, 13 says, And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceive that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled. And then they realized they had been with Yeshua, with Jesus. Wow. So once again, the ones God spoke to, the ones God showed angels to, the ones who walked and talked with the Son of God, were fishermen, were tax collectors. We don't know who the others were, or what they were for sure. They were nobodies. That's my point. Yet today we know they were greatly used by God. But at the time, who were they? They appeared as very ordinary folks. Now some of those that God used as judges and prophets were sinful and imperfect. We're all 
We've all been sinners. David numbered Israel. God was so upset with that that 70,000 Israelites were killed in God's anger before he stopped. And then David also killed the husband of the young woman he had adultery with, saw her bathing at night, called her up, she gets pregnant, calls the father in, the, her husband in, I mean, to uh, the father of the child uh, to be, called uh, Uriah in, and uh, he, Uriah refused to go home because he wanted not to have a privilege this men out in the field didn't have. And so what did David do? He wrote a letter uh, asking his relative Joab to have him killed. And uh, he, who, did, who delivered the letter? Uriah. It was terrible. God hated that. If that's what you knew about David, yeah, you'd heard also that he'd done the Goliath thing and all that. And he liked to play the Psalms and the harps. But now you've heard what he's done here with Uriah. Would you have even sat down and had dinner with him? Would you have let him sit next to you in church? If you were the pastor, would you have even let him into your church? You know what I'm trying to say. Samson, he broke his Nazarite vows. He seemed to be a bit of a womanizer. But David, Samson, they're in the, David's alluded to in Hebrews 11 in there. Certainly Samson's mentioned by name. What's my point? Don't automatically disdain or reject someone with revelations that are truly from God. And we'll have to discern that just because they've done some horrible things in their past. Horrible things. If someone has revelations from God, he may not be a superbly righteous person. Like I said, even the kings like Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Pharaoh, come on. Unless you get to that level of righteousness that we have by faith from God as a gift to us, the faith of Jesus, I mean the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember, God is all about redemption. And so my whole point here is we can praise God and love God even as we finally are convinced and believe that this child is being used by God. This old man had a true dream from God. We'll have to test those, but we've been so conditioned I think so many of us have been so conditioned to doubt the veracity. I have been. That we're going to be on guard so much that we won't even be watching and looking for where God may be speaking. My point is, look guys, God used nobodies for many of the best revelations. How many people do you know who got to hear and see a choir of angels you know who God let that happen to? You know who. Shepherds in the field by night. To you is born this day. The Lamb of Judah. The Messiah. You'll find him wrapped up in swaddling clothes in a manger. And the angels in the world back then in Judah. Shepherds. Most of them were uneducated and illiterate that most of them were very poor. And yet to whom did God initially choose to reveal the news that the Savior had been born, his very son? Did he go to the high priest? Did he go to the Pharisees? Did he go to the Levites and the scribes? Did he go to the town, I don't know, mayors? Did he go to Herod? No. No. He chose the lowly, uneducated, disdained shepherds. Luke 2 is posted, verses 8 to 20. Remember, the Pharaoh said, you, can, you guys, uh, your Israelites can have that section of land over there. It's nice, Goshen. Uh, but stay away from the Egyptians because Egyptians don't like shepherds. The Bible even mentions that. They don't like shepherds. They look down on shepherds. But think of it. How many of you would have been more receptive if a bunch of uneducated shepherds or whoever you would think would be the lowest level of our society today came to you and said, 
we saw angels, we heard angels sing the most beautiful songs. Singing like you've never like you'd never believe, and a glory that was just so wonderful and beautiful. Would you have believed? I change not, God says. I change not. So I think in the years ahead, it's very possible some of the greatest revelations may come from the lowest of our society. God often used shepherds. Remember, even the greatest king of Israel, David, had been a shepherd. And in fact, Abraham, in a sense, was a shepherd in his, his following. Certainly Isaac and Jacob and, and, and Rachel and Rebekah, they were all shepherds. So you see what I'm saying? Amos was a shepherd, and he picked sycamore fruit as well. I'll, we'll post it up here. Amos 7, verses 14 to 15. Amos says to Amaziah, who was saying, how dare you speak to the king like this? He's, I think he's up there in Israel at this point. Uh, he was from Judah, but God used him to speak prophecies both in Judah and to the northern ten tribes in the north to the kingdom of Israel. Amos said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. But I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then Jehovah took me as I followed the flock. And Jehovah said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. So here I am, Amaziah. Yeah, I know I'm no prophet. I know I'm just a picker of fruit and a shepherd. But God appeared to me uh, and, and told me. Jehovah took me from following the flock and said to me, go, go preach. Now, what if God decides to reveal himself again to un un uneducated nobodies like that? He doesn't change. And even you who are handpicked by God, some of you hearing this may end up being given dreams and visions. And I have to discern if you're from God or not. But it could be you, could be. Remember that God says he calls the not so noble, 1 Corinthians 1, Let's put it up there. 1 Corinthians 1, verses uh, 26 to 28, somewhere in there. The not many mighty, not many noble are called, but the nobodies, the nobodies that God may receive glory. Paul defines us as the nobodies of the world. So we've got a good thing in that God favors talking just to pastors and evangelists and televangelists and people who've written books on the Bible and popes or prophets or cardinals or men of the cloth. No, 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 he does not. I'm not saying he doesn't use those. I'm saying that he doesn't limit himself. And more likely than not, we're going to be surprised to whom God, through whom God works. Sometimes the one God uses don't even know they're being used. How's that? And sometimes some will come to him and say, I thought you were using me. Matthew 7, 22, they'll come to him and say, Lord, Lord, what do you mean we're in trouble? Lord, Lord, where have we not prophesied in your name? And you go on reading that in Matthew 7, 22, 23, 24, and he's going to say to them, I never knew you. Get out. Get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness, iniquity. Now, having said that, there were people who didn't know the words they were speaking were actually inspired by God, and they were not people of God. Figure that one out. You want an example? John 11, verses 49 to 52. The Jews were afraid that all this popularity that Yeshua was getting and the fact that he was, he, he, you know, it, it could be a riot. It could be a, it could be a time of uh, upset feelings and uprisings. And they, they were afraid that the Romans would take away their station, their position, their offices, and what are we going to do about this Jesus in John 11? And then we come to verse 49 to 52. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, You don't know anything at all. Nor do you consider that it's expedient for us to have one man, that one man should die for all the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. We don't want the Romans coming here, sure. So let's sacrifice one person, okay? One man should die for the people. He didn't even know what he was saying. One man, Yeshua, should die for the people. 
and not that the whole nation should perish. He goes on to say, verse 51, um, Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and that not only for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father in heaven. Yeshua, thank you. Another example is in Jeremiah 18. I love this example, too. Here's a guy who probably was poor. He's just making pots. And he's got the mud going around here. He's got the... Have you ever watched a guy making pots and all that? It's incredible. Ceramics. Beautiful. And God told Jeremiah to go watch the potter. I've got a lesson for you from that potter, he says. Did that potter think that he was playing a role in a scripture that would be used over and over again? I doubt it. Jeremiah 18, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from Jehovah, the Lord is Jehovah, you know. Go down at once to the potter's house, and there I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working away at the wheel, but the jar he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand, so he made it into a different jar, another jar, as it seemed right for him to do. Then the word of Jehovah, verse 5, came to me, verse 6, house of Israel. Can I not treat you like this potter treats his clay? This is Jehovah's declaration. Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might announce concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, and destroy it. You guys are on really thin ice right now. I'm about ready to tear you out of the ground. However, if that nation on whom I've made an announcement turns from its evil, turns from its evil, the nation turns from its evil, I will not bring the disaster on it I had planned. I don't know that everybody has to. The examples we have in the Old Testament where if there were ten righteous in Sodom, Sodom would not have been destroyed. At another time, I announce, in verse 9 now, So verse 8 says, if they turn, I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. So stop thinking that all the things we're reading about in prophecies are set in stone. They're not. God himself is saying, if people will hear my voice and turn from their evil way as a nation, if you don't believe that can happen, fine, that's your that's your belief. I'd rather be more positive and believe that God's Spirit, God doesn't want to destroy us all. He doesn't want to. Verse 9, At another time I announce that I will build and plant a nation or a kingdom. However, if, if it does what's evil in my sight by not listening to my voice, I will not bring the good I had said I would do to it. God says, you've got to give me the right to change, just like this potter does. He gets started on a pot, doesn't like the way it's going, throws it away and gets another one. Are you getting the point of the sermon? God can. God does. Reveal himself in all sorts of ways, all sorts of channels, all sorts of messages. Will you be ready for it? Will you be open to it? There's another story that I want to look at my notes on this one, because I'm not going to read all the verses on it. But 2 Chronicles 20, King Jehoshaphat of Judah and many of the Jews had come to Jerusalem, the, the protection of the city walls and the, the walls around the city that they had. And all these enemy nations had come around to conquer and destroy Jerusalem. It was a scary time. Way more of them than there were Jews. And you read the first oh, 11, 12 verses King Jehoshaphat's starting right. He's on his knees in prayer. He presents his case before God. He gathers all the people together in the square of Jerusalem. And he announces to them what's going on and that we have to seek our God and all of that. And then just imagine the faith you'd have to all of a sudden, while the king is speaking, maybe a pause in what he's saying, some Levite named Jehaziel, basically interrupts the king who had been speaking all this time in verses 5 to 12. 
I'm in 2 Chronicles 20. Imagine that. And then we read this. Verse 13, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children, stood before Jehovah. And the spirit of Jehovah came upon Jehaziel, who was a Levite. It goes on to say that at the end of verse 14. He wasn't high priest. He wasn't a prophet. He was just a Levite. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. Imagine the guts it took to interrupt the king. You too, king, you've got to listen as well. And thus says Jehovah to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Verse 16, Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by a certain place, he says here, and you'll find them at a certain other place. Verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still. See the salvation of Jehovah is with you. Don't be afraid, okay? But here's what I'm saying to you. Remember this. Verse 16, tomorrow, God's telling me to tell all of you, leave the safety and protection of the city walls. Go out there and see your enemy face to face. You won't have to fight. You've got to trust God. He's going to fight for you. How many of us would be leaving the next morning in the city walls, the safety of the city walls? Because some Levite said God told him that that's what we should all do. Would you have done it? Would you have trusted and believed what God was revealing something to him? It wasn't like he was a high priest with a Urim and a thumb and with signals from God, something like that. No, honestly. Could you have seen that, that as a message from God? You mean I'm supposed to leave the safety of the city and go face thousands and thousands of people the next day? And they did. Now that's what I'm talking about. They did. Now we're going to have to be checking and, 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 and the messenger and the message make sure they are from God. But there will be some revelations coming. Let's not miss them. You also know about dreams. Now, especially if you're on medication, be careful the dreams you're having. Medication often will give you really weird dreams, really weird dreams. I get them. I get off the medication, I don't seem to have the really weird ones. So yes, be certain that God in these last days is speaking to whom he chooses. And, uh, but God used dreams a lot with Joseph, with Nebuchadnezzar, with Pharaoh, with Solomon, Joseph, the husband of Mary, had dreams, and so on. God himself uh, even said to Aaron and Miriam when they were criticizing Moses in Numbers 12, he says, how dare you do that? He says, normally I speak to my people and prophets through dreams and visions. But this man, Moses, I speak to face to face. How dare you speak against him? And he gave uh, Miriam, I think it was a week, uh, leprosy for a week. So dreams and visions are quite commonplace. Now, sometimes people will get the revelations not from a dream or a vision. They just have, this is more what I seem to get, more strong urges. Go call somebody, go see somebody, have the faith to pray for, pray for a neighbor with cancer and have the cancer be healed. And, and just do it. And you obey. You obey those strong feelings and urges or to call somebody or do something. Sometimes it's from an angel who's going to be appearing and conveying a message from God to you. Numerous examples of that all through the Bible. I'm convinced an angel appeared to me and my brother and his wife one time. He was so discouraged thinking God may not have even be listening to his prayers anymore. He'd had a couple strokes and just think everything was going wrong, even with everything. His wife got Alzheimer's. And I, I'll tell the story some other time. My point is, it was just clear as a bell that this lady was dressed in a Panera Bread outfit, a Hispanic-looking lady, came, comes to our table, and because I've been praying all the night before, that, Father, please, somehow, tell my brother, you have not forsaken him. So she was standing up by the wall, and she comes down to our table. And, hi, how are you? And, and she says, um, looks right at my brother, and says, I've been sent to tell you. God has not forsaken you. God has not forgotten you. I'm, I'm having chills going up my back. This is what I prayed for. Who is this woman? I thought it was a woman here at Panera Bread down in Ventura who had a revelation or something. That's what I believed. And uh, 
you are going to have to go through it. He's not going to remove the stroke. And your wife is going to have to go through her ordeal, her Alzheimer's. But God wants you to know as you go through it that he's with you still. You, you have this trial you, you'll have to bear. Uh, you can convey it to, to Christ, but you will go through it. But he hasn't forgotten you. He's very well aware of your good works. And he wanted me to give you that encouragement. And she sat down and talked to us. And then got up later on after our lunch. I wanted to go thank her. Nobody had seen her. Nobody, there was nobody who fit that description among all the staff there. And they said none of our people would ever be standing by a wall watching as she had been for three or four or five minutes before she came to our table. My brother had gone to the bathroom with his wife because uh, she had Alzheimer's, needed help. When he came back, I was sitting at the table and I looked at him. And I said, I believe we've just experienced an angel because there, were, they, there was nobody there. I wanted to thank her. And the manager says, we don't have someone like that. No one's left here. No one's come in here. No, we don't have that person. So I believe that was an angel. I really do. If you don't believe me, that's fine. I believe it. We're going to see angels. God changes not. Peter was in jail, chained up, probably chained to a guard on each side. And an angel came and dropped the chains and they all kept on sleeping. Those poor guards died the next day. They were killed. And the door opens and everything else. I, you know, read the story. I think it's in Acts 12. It may not be 12. But anyway, maybe 12 or 11 or something like that. But God doesn't change. God's going to send us some angels too. And in some cases, it appears that the one we know as Yeshua himself will sometimes come, as he did to Samuel. I love the verse. And you know, Genesis 15, verse 1 and 4 to Abram, to Abraham, it's called Abram still, it says that uh, the word of the Lord came to Abram and said, blah, blah, blah. You can find that phrase, the word of the Lord. Who's the word of Jehovah? Who's the word? It's Yeshua. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among men, right? He became Yeshua. And so anyway, I'll repeat uh, 1 Samuel 3, 21, it says, Yehovah, that's the Lord, revealed himself. It says, Yehovah, the Lord, revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh, in Shiloh by, or through, the word of Yehovah. So we would say today, God the Father revealed himself to Samuel through Jesus Christ by using the word to be the one to appear to him, to talk to him. Uh, the Father himself has never been seen by human beings. Some of you don't agree with that. That's clear, clearly in Scripture. But anyway, sometimes the phrase could be just a clear vision, the way that God works with us, a clear perception of the Word of God, maybe a clear vision. A lot of people had visions. Genesis 51, 15, 1, Genesis 15, 1, the Word of God came to Abraham in a vision. Also verse 4, and uh, 1 Samuel 15, 10, Samuel had a vision. Nathan the prophet had several visions. David had visions. I'll put the, scripture, I'll put the scriptures in the notes here. Uh, we'll toss this up there. Maybe David, 1 Chronicles 22, 8, had a vision. Jeremiah had numerous visions and encounters with Jehovah and uh, the Word, through the Word. Jeremiah 1, 2, and 4, and 11. Um, Jeremiah 34, let's put this up. Jeremiah 34, verse 12. Therefore the word of Jehovah came to Jeremiah from Jehovah. Now look at that wording. Jeremiah 34, 12. Therefore the word of Jehovah came to Jeremiah from Jehovah. So Jehovah is God the Father. The word of Jehovah is the one we now know as Jesus Christ. He himself is in his own right often called Jehovah. Because no one's seen the Father. Ezekiel had it. Zechariah had it. Sometimes God will reveal himself to us, if we have eyes to see, through a rainbow like he did to Noah and his family. And God gets very upset when people take the rainbow and make the rainbow covenant of Noah, the, the Noatian covenant, and use it for their movement. It's not good. God's not pleased with that. 
when God takes marriage, when people who, I mean, God who gave us marriage between one man and one woman, and that becomes redefined by our Supreme Court to be whatever kind of marriage between whatever kind of people you want, doesn't have to be one man, one woman, they say. The reason that's so bad to do that is because marriage pictures Yeshua himself, the man, Yeshua, and the woman, the church. We can't consecrate, I mean, we can't desecrate these things that are so holy to God. The rock, a rock that split and produced water had so much symbolism. The ark that Noah built had so much symbolism. It represented Yeshua in so many levels. The one door, the no rudder, God controls everything. The tabernacle, the temple, the colors, the accoutrements, the animals, the priests, the altars, the, everything, all pictured Yeshua. It goes on and on. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I should wrap it up. God has not finished revealing himself yet. I'm excited about it. But when you go on YouTube and you start listening to this prophet or that prophet saying this thing or that thing, now if it comes to pass, my ears would perk up a little higher for the next time that person spoke. If the things they say do not come to pass. Now, as opposed to a strong feeling some people have that I've had a strong feeling that God still had more work to do with President Trump and even through America. And it might still be proven true in 2024. That guy's got more energy than five of, five of us men put together. Even when he's 77, 78 years old, if God wants him to come back in 2024, then God can. If God wants him to win this recount there will be rioting, probably, like spoiled brats who don't get their way. You don't see the cities burning now when the conservatives didn't get their way. Whatever God's plan is for the nation is what's going to happen. It's okay to have opinions. It's okay to think, I think this is going to happen. I have a strong feeling that Trump's going to win. If that's going to happen, that's one thing. But if a person says, I had a vision, I had a dream, God told me, this and God told me that, and it doesn't come to pass. No, you have a false prophet on your hands in that case. So God's not finished revealing himself yet. In these last days, he's going to continue as before, revealing himself. He changes not, no shadow of turning in him. So be ready for many, many revelations and be ready for the very exciting time. You're living in, you're living in Bible days. You're li this is Bible days, the best of the best. So don't feel like we're any bit at all uh, missing out on what Abraham and all those people had. We have a lot more coming up. Father in heaven, our great, awesome Father, lovely, beautiful, wonderful, amazing Father. And Yeshua, our Savior, our big brother, our King, our Master, our Messiah, our Rock, our Lion of Judah, and also our friend and our brother. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Father in heaven, that you are going to reveal yourself to many, many in the years to come. Give us the sight to see, the ears to hear, and the wisdom to know which ones are your people and which ones are not. There will be many who come and even performing works and miracles, if possible, to deceive us. Help us not be deceived. Give us a spirit to pierce right through the soul and discern which ones are your true prophets, messengers, which ones are truly giving messages that are truly from you. May you open the gates of heaven now and reveal your will to whomever you will. And may we listen and may we look and may we enjoy hearing from you, whether it's from a child or a world leader or whether it's from a prophet or from a shepherd or a fisherman. Thank you, dear God in heaven. Thank you, wonderful Yeshua. We close now and we ask your protection. We put your guardian angels. And if you want to change things in America and around the world, may the Lion of Judah roar. And may your light come down bright on the dark areas that need to be exposed. And let us submit to your will. 
May you pour down from heaven the gifts and the blessings and give us your love. Best of all, your love. We thank you now. We praise you now. May your face shine upon us. And may we glorify you in everything we do. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Yeshua. We pray this of and by and through your Holy Spirit in us. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.